So I'm sure we've all heard the adage that uh, silence is golden, right? And then if you were to go back to the original Asiatic source for that, uh, the original quotation is silence is golden, but speaking is silver. Now, in an oral communication class, uh, we only get one lecture on this, but perhaps listening is the most important lecture out of this entire semester. Because if you don't, if you're not an effective listener, if you don't have the ability to grasp what another person is saying, to read nonverbal feedback uh, loops, and to listen to what other people have to say about you as an individual, then you really don't have the opportunity to create a further conversation or to even learn about yourself when people disclose information to you. So today I'd like to take a second to talk about listening, and uh, this is kind of an overview of what we're gonna be going over today. So remember that listening is not just focusing in and listening to someone, but rather it's a collection of skills involving attending, concentrating, and receiving a particular message that's out there, uh, learning it, understanding it, putting it back in your own frame of reference, uh, remembering what another person has said, being able to create cognitive schemas and boxes where you can put the information about that individual into your own memory banks, being able to evaluate or critically think about information that is being presented to you to judge its merit, if you will, and then finally, of course, one of the most important parts, being able to respond back in a way that makes the other person feel validated, to continue a further conversation with them, to get your point across, or to make sure that you can further an interpersonal reaction with the other individual. Now, all of these stages aren't necessarily linear. It's not that you suddenly receive, understand, remember, evaluate, and then respond, right? Now, odds are you probably would be responding after you've gone through some panoply of these other uh, objects that are up here. But remember, they can move back and forth. You might be in a situation where you need to critically think or evaluate a message before you even really accept it. You might just dismiss it on face, knowing that it's wrong information that's out there. Or you might remember something about a prior conversation that's going to influence the way in which you understand or receive the message, because maybe this is a cycle that that person's repeating over and over again. So remember that all of these sort of overlap with each other. We receive, we hear, we attend to a message, we understand it, we learn it, we decipher it, we ascribe meaning to it. Uh, we remember, we call it, or reframe it in our own personal cognitive schemas. We evaluate, we judge, we criticize information out there based on its merit. And then of course, when we answer or respond to a person, we may give them feedback, but we've got to figure out the proper way to do that that makes them still feel validated as individuals. Now, when we think about listening, it's a very important skill. It's uh, something that takes up a majority of our days. Time and time again, when we ask businesses, you know, when we ask bosses, what's the number one thing you're looking for in an employee? They always say the ability to listen. And I'm sure even right now, as you folks are thinking about this, you probably have a friend who doesn't listen very effectively, right? Maybe they're one of those people who does the uh-huh, 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 constantly giving you one back channel and cue. Or maybe you've got that one friend who always talks loud and makes you listen to what they have to say, right? Or, or maybe you have that friend who always talks about what they want to talk about and they never get the opportunity for you to disclose information when you're chatting with them. All of these different speaking flaws are things that we can work on, you know, when it comes to our ability to listen to another person and adapt our own messages. Now, some research that came out by uh, Adler, uh, Rosenfeld, and Proctor back in the early 2000s took a look at the average college student's life, right? So you folks going through your everyday college experience, what are you doing throughout the course of the day? Well, I bet you probably not many of you have read too much, but you should be reading about 16% of your day. Get that textbook, start getting into those pages. Um, if you are in a, in a writing intensive class, like this one, for example, you might spend about 9% of your day writing communicatively. And uh, odds are, if you were back here on campus, you'd be talking with other people up and down the halls. You probably still are talking with your friends and family. But we spend about 30% of our day speaking. However, a majority of our day, 45% of our day, is spent listening. You're listening to everything, whether it be passively listening to music or the radio when you're driving to wherever you need to go, or you know if you're watching YouTube videos and uh, actively listening in on something that's being portrayed on social media or any other internet uh, <laughs> archive that you're going through, or you know if you're just listening to someone in your family, your friends, you know, or listening to a lecture in this particular situation, we spend a majority of our time listening, and this is why it's important. Unfortunately, we only get one lecture on this, but as part of an oral communication class, it's important for us to really parse out this 45% and what we can do to make it more effective. 
So let's go over some of these stages of listening. Well, first, there's receiving, right? So there is a difference between the biological process of hearing something go into your ear and being able to receive the actual message psychologically. So if you think about it, you know, anat and from an anatomy perspective, we got pretty amazing ear canals, right? So we've got this eardrum, sound waves come in, vibrate off the drum, it's connected to those three little tiny bones, what is it, like the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, and then those are attached to our cochlea, which has a bunch of little tiny hairs on it, and those flip back and forth, registering the sound as it comes into our ears, and then the inner ear creates that into a bunch of neurological pulses, which eventually gets decoded by our brain. So it's a pretty complex biological process. But remember, there's a distinction to be made. You can hear something or you can listen to something, right? But hearing leads to listening only in a small amount of situations. If you think about it, hearing is the only real sense that you can't shut off. You know, when you go to sleep, you close your eyes, you're not taking in any visual stimulation. You know, if you go to sleep, eh, sometimes you can nudge somebody and kind of wake them up, but odds are their touch isn't as, you know, as, as tactile as it is when you're actually awake. Uh, maybe you might wake up to a smell if it's a really good smell, but odds are your nose isn't working as strong, and your sense of taste really isn't working while you're sleeping as well. But your alarm clock wakes you up every day. Your hearing is always on. So your brain has had to modulate, to evolve, if you will, over the course of your years to determine what you should just hear or what you should attend in on. So your, your alarm clock has a very distinct ring to it that will always get you up because you've psychologically trained yourself to do so. So for most of our days, we're going around just hearing something, right? So you might hear somebody walking down, you know, the footsteps of your house or down a hallway, or you might hear somebody honking a horn outside, or you might be passively listening to music, but that doesn't get you to attend to it. When you hear a fire alarm go off outside or you hear an ambulance come by, you might attend more because you know that there is an attachment to those particular sounds. So when we hear auditory stimuli, we're not necessarily listening to those auditory stimuli. So big, dis big distinction, hearing is a physiological process by which things are bouncing off of your eardrum, whereas listening is a psychological process where you choose to attend in on the auditory stimuli. Now, how do we make this a more effective process? Well, when we're listening to somebody, so now we've got the auditory stimuli, we're focusing in on what they have to say, and we're attending to the actual message that they're putting forward, we should be more effective by listening for what is being said and then also what is not being said, right? Making sure that we are trying to create a complete picture from what people are saying and what they're not saying. Because oftentimes what they omit is another important area that you could further a conversation with, or it could be a, a situation to detect whether or not somebody's being duplicitous or lying towards you. When we're receiving or listening to another person, it's important for us to focus on the verbal and the nonverbal stimuli that are out there, because oftentimes we can find discrepancies between the two. You should try not to interrupt. You know, tons and tons of research has been done on interruptions. There is almost no time ever where an interruption is actually an appropriate thing to do while another person is having an interpersonal interaction with you. There was one study that said that if you're on a first date and you interrupt the person by saying that you like what they like, that it might increase your levels of likability, but odds are if you're someone who's interrupting somebody, you're going to be perceived as being brash, as being impatient, as being arrogant. Interruptions almost never work out well for the person who's listening to the other individual. And then avoid jumping to conclusions, right? Don't assume that you understand something before the person has finished speaking. One of the problems with the human body is, is that the average person you know, speaks at a rate of maybe 100 to 150 words per minute. I'm a little bit faster, right? But our brain can comprehend information at around 400 to 800 words a minute. There is always a time lag between these. And the problem is, is our brains are working faster than the other person is speaking. And when that happens, we eventually start to jump to conclusions. So you need to always psychologically refocus back in on what a person is saying, making sure you're consistently attending into and receiving the auditory stimuli. Now, we've grabbed the actual stimuli that are out there, how do we compartmentalize it? How do we organize it within our own brains? Well, there's a process of understanding by which you're taking these auditory stimuli, you're focusing in on them, and then you're categorizing them into certain perceptual schemas that you have inside of your mind. 
So this is actually the true time where you are quote unquote decoding a speaker's actual message. So you're using the language that's being translated back into the thoughts and feelings that are on your mind. So you're grasping the thoughts and if you're a really effective listener, you're trying to grasp the underlying emotional tone. Because remember, a lot of times where we need to be the most effective listeners are oftentimes situations where we're dealing with somebody who might be going through emotional crisis or maybe emotional joy and being able to understand the feelings that come along with a particular uh, context or within a particular uh, statement that another individual is saying is something that can add a lot more power to your ability to respond to them. Now, this can be, of course, more effective if you relate the uh, speaker's information back to what you already know, right? So if you've already got a cognitive schema about person X or experience Y, and you can relate that back and say, ah, oh, that reminds me of da da da, or that reminds me of something you said, these oftentimes can give you more pathways for further conversation. You try to also put yourself in the other person's shoes. I think this is one of the biggest problems we have in today's society right now. We don't really get the chance to empathize with too many other individuals. If you really think about it, since we've been in lockdown or even in any kind of social media area, we are really limited in the emotional or empathic aspects of being able to communicate with another individual. I mean, at best, all we're doing is putting up a care emoji, right, or a heart to say that we like somebody. This is far, far different than being able to physically put yourself into their shoes, right? Well, actually mentally put yourself into their shoes so you can understand, sympathize, and empathize where, where another speaker is coming from. And then, of course, this will be the first step of what we call active listening, being able to paraphrase or repeat back in your own words what the other person is saying. And this is a very valuable technique that we'll get to in a little bit here. But this whole notion of being able to paraphrase what a person is saying and then facilitate that mutual understanding with them is something that's going to add a lot more power to your particular speech. Now, after we sort of compartmentalize the ideas and logic within our own particular minds, then we need to remember it. Because oftentimes, if we can't remember what another person has said, then the conversation is going to come to a standstill. So effective listening requires remembering. You have to be able to think about what a person is saying, and not just repeating back the last five words that you've said to them. I'm sure all of you folks have got that friend who, yeah, so what was I just talking about? And they'll repeat back the last five words that you just said to them. Yeah, this is not an effective aspect of being able to listen to somebody. If you've understood the message, compartmentalized it, paraphrased it in your own mind, then you should be able to remember a nice tidbit that you can bring back in further conversation. So you always want to make sure that you focus your ideas down, back down to the central ideas that the other person is talking about. You know, you want to make sure that you're not asking weird, extravagant, extraneous kind of questions that don't make any sense with regards to the average conversation. You know, I just couldn't believe it, right? It's like, like one of my buddies just got into a car accident, right? And you get into a big car accident, and like my friends are asking the dumbest questions, right? Like, oh, what color was the car, right? Like, who cares what color the car was, right? Or what race was the driver, right? Like, who cares, right? Are you okay? You just got in a car accident, you know? So making sure that you focus back on the central idea is what's actually happening in the particular situation. You also want to make sure that you organize it. Now, human beings really like to have nice chronological or topical or spatial structures in our minds, which we'll go over later on when we talk about speeches. But when you're able to organize what you hear into nice, Usually chronological structures, this is what happens in somebody's past, this is what's happening to somebody now, this is what I might be able to help them with in the future. Giving that little organizational schema oftentimes can really help with regards to contextualizing a conversation within time and space. You want to make sure you unite new information with old information. So the new information that you're getting from the person should go back into your memory banks with the other schemas and the other you know, ideas that you've had about that other individual from the first time that you've met them. And then, of course, if you are having a problem time remembering, kind of like me in my old age now, right? Uh, making sure you repeat those names over and over again or repeating those key concepts over and over again to yourself, even aloud, uh, can add a lot more persuasibility and help it get into those old memory box, right? Uh, repetition equals persuasion. Repetition equals persuasion. Repetition equals persuasion. <laughs> Repeating something over and over again is going to create a stronger neural circuit when you're trying to remember that information at a later point in time. So um, 
I don't really advise that people jump to conclusions and judge things, but you know, in today's day and age, you know, we really have to turn on these critical thinking skills. There is so much false information out there. It is so easily accessible. And the fact that we now have sophisticated algorithms that are trying to enrage you on social media, through the internet, guiding your searches, taking you to information that is, you know, demonstrably false, but still trying to get that inside of your heads just to get an emotional glint out of you. Um, I think human beings can fight this. I think, I, I think in my heart's heart that we all have critical thinking skills. We can question sources. We can question data. We can think of hypothetical scenarios. We have tools and skills that we can apply to situations. And it may be becoming more and more important in today's age than it was back in mine. So when I went to college, it was like, you know what? Go to the library. You go to the library, you look it up, you find out the real facts. It was all right there. But nowadays, with everything at our fingertips, it's so easy for someone to misinform us, it's pretty important that we start to develop some critical thinking and evaluating skills. So we all do judge messages that we hear. You know, so whether it be one of your friends who's going through the same old breakup, the same old racket, and you're thinking the entire time, ah, this is this dude's cycle again, right? <laughs> this is this woman's cycle again. Uh, we might be judging people at an interpersonal level, but there's also factual data that's out there. I'm sure we can all think of a friend who's got some opinion about the COVID vaccine right now, some opinion about the election right now, some opinion about where the future of our country is going, but can we take apart each one of those messages and evaluate it on an actual case-by-case -case basis? So how do we evaluate more effectively? Well, first of all, you always want to listen to the end of what another person has to say. One of the saddest things that I think has been happening now is that people will show video clips and they'll cut off those video clips saying, oh, that person's a bad person. We listen to political pundits who say, oh, we cut into this or cut into that. And that is exactly what we not need to do. When we're evaluating a message, we have to hear the entire message. You have to listen to it in its context. You have to evaluate it as a full message. Unfortunately, I think in this amazing clickbait, sort of immediate instant gratification society, we oftentimes don't get to the end of a message. You know, TLDR, right? That there's too much information out there. I didn't even bother to get it all in. So try to resist evaluation until you fully understand what a person has to say. You never know what their complete message is until you've listened to the entire message. And then second, there's a lot of research that has been done on what's known as the veracity bias or, or a truth bias. And, uh, and there's some evolutionary psychologists that have made some arguments that we need to have uh, a, a basic level of, of truthiness, right, that we give someone the benefit of the doubt from the beginning. And I think this is good for evaluating messages, too. That if we immediately cut someone off or we immediately assume that the person is out to get us, we're not going to listen to whatever pearls might be within that particular speech or within that particular interaction. So I think that from a beginning point, whenever we're interacting with someone or listening to a speech or listening to a presentation, we should assume that that person has goodwill towards the audience, a, a basic level of ethos, right? Whenever you folks walk into every college classroom, you know, you may end up hating the teacher <laughs> by the end of the term, but at the beginning, you should at least say, hey, we're going to give that teacher a shot. Or I'm going to assume that they probably have enough education that they might know something about what they're trying to say. And then finally, and this is one of the hardest things, the problem of, of philosophy ever since the 1600s, the infamous fact-value split. Uh, that being able to distinguish a fact from an opinion is a, a very important skill that I think we really haven't learned or we really haven't uh, looked at enough in today's society. Remember that facts exist in and of themselves, that this is a table, this is a PowerPoint presentation, you know, th these are all facts that are out there. Now, me recording myself during a PowerPoint presentation to put up on YouTube for you to watch later, is that a more effective way of speaking? Well, that's an interpretation or an opinion. Some people might find this video more entertaining than anything I'm doing over Zoom right now. And some other people might be <laughs> TLDR, right? So you might want to make sure that you distinguish the facts that are out there in the real world from the opinions about them. And this is another problem that we have with journalism. You know, when I was younger, I used to, uh, I used to actually watch PBS, right? Like the old PBS, because you knew it was, you know, it was supposed to be true journalism. And journalism has, you know, three tenets to it, right? First of all, it's verifiable. So you can check the sources of a good journalist, and the journalist will say, yes, these are my sources, right? 
Um, it's independent, so that it, it doesn't try to take a political bias or a spin, a spin. It takes a very unique, independent perspective on a particular area. And it's accountable that if a journalist is wrong, they have to print a correction. They have to say, hey, you know what? I got this wrong. I'm sorry. Here's my apology about it all. Now, I'm sure you won't find any of that in today's media, right? You don't have the V, the I, and the A in today's media because everything right now is political punditry. It's all opinions. It's somebody's take on something else. You're never really hearing what the original facts about the issue are, or if you do hear the facts, they cut it off real quick to make an evaluative statement about the fact before the person has even completed it. And this is really unfortunate, I think. I think now in our sensation-seeking, selective exposure world where we all just want that serotonin jump by hearing something that agrees with our own particular viewpoints, we've really gotten away from seeing a fact as a fact, being able to look at numbers, being able to look at observations, being able to engage in a scientific process of deduction to figure out what the real truth value or what a factual assertion actually is. Now people have got so much bias that we're not even really sure where the fact value split lies. And this is something that was born all the way back in the you know, 1600s uh, about different types of, of, of cited information, if you will, that you know, the rhetorical sensitivity of any particular fact is going to blur the way in which we interpret it. Finally, uh, let's take a second to think about responding. So now we're in a situation, you've got the information, so it was just a stimuli bouncing off of your ear, but you've chosen to attend to it, right? You've received that, you're paying attention to it, you're starting to understand it, you're putting it into your cognitive boxes, you're starting to evaluate it, you say, okay, this is good information, I'm gonna listen to what this person has to say. Now, how do you respond? Because this is a key aspect, because you can't further a conversation unless the other person feels validated in some kind of way. You need to make sure that you're listening to enough of their information, that you're providing meaningful feedback to the other person such that they want to continue that conversation with you. I don't know if you folks have got a couple of really good friends that really listen to you, where you start off and you have a conversation and it all comes kind of full circle by the end. You almost lose track of time because the other people are giving you appropriate responses and feedback that are giving you multiple loops and multiple different directions that you can take the conversation. So what should we not do, right? Well, we should try to make sure that we don't use the same back channeling cue over again, right? So this is the person who goes the uh-huh, 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 or mm-hmm, 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 yeah, 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 mm. that kind of thing. Where one person is giving you one feedback loop that's just being over and over again, and it's not unique to your particular situation. So while the person is speaking, you want to give them a variety of back channeling cues. You want to give them a smile here, or a head, head nod there, or maybe even a, oh, interesting, <laughs> at a certain point in time. But you want to make sure you use a variety of different back channeling cues to show that you're still focused and paying attention to the other person while they're speaking. And then after the person has stopped talking, so you know we, we have this very intricate dance. And, and most, most of the time, we don't really realize it. But usually, when a person is speaking, they're not giving you much eye contact. They're talking around, blah, 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 blah. And as they come to the end, that's when they give you the eye contact. That's your turn to speak. And with that turn-taking signal, it usually happens non-verbally, then you have an opportunity for you to engage in a paraphrase. What I'm hearing you say is this, this, and this. What I really think is interesting about what you just said is this. Oh, that's intriguing. I find it intriguing when you said blank, blank, and blank. You give the opportunity to give them back some of that information to demonstrate that you're, in fact, listening to them. Now, we can improve this responding uh, by expressing support for the speaker, right? So if a person's taking their time to talk to you, I think that's something special. You know, a lot of people don't really see this notion that you know, humans are the symbol using animal, right? Even all the way back to Aristotle, he says the one thing that differentiates us from the animals is our ability to use a common symbol system like language. And uh, when we take that time to share that symbol system with somebody else, that's a unique moment. You know, that's an interpersonal moment where there's opportunities for self-disclosure, there's opportunities for intimacy, there's opportunities for bonding, there's, there's opportunities for deception, <laughs> there's opportunities for all different kinds of things. And expressing support for the speaker is the best way to keep that conversation going. This can be done non-verbally through nice smiles, nods, open body postures, and it can also be done verbally by actually repeating back or paraphrasing what another person is saying, asking questions that go along particular conversational routes. 
we want to make sure we use a variety of those back channeling cues, right? So we don't want to be the person who's just doing the uh-huh, 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 rather, but we're using a variety of different ones that engage the listener and the speaker. Uh, take ownership of our own messages. So we might find ourselves at certain points in times in our lives where we're engaged in conflict with another individual that's out there. And one of the biggest things, right, is to not lose our head, not to blame the other person. And that's, it's so easy to fall into that, you know. Taking control or ownership of your own responses by using I messages, well, I feel this way, or I am put in this situation, or I feel as if I am by blah, 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 oftentimes really can take the conflict out of a situation. You know, so a lot of great research done by John Gottman and his group up at the University of Washington where they've tried to figure out, you know, what's the best way to keep relationships going. And it really comes down to disarming conflict. And one of the best ways to disarm conflict is not to blame the other person, but rather just express how you feel about a particular situation. And then, of course, just avoiding the, the common ones, you know, that we can all see, you know, the, the seeming preoccupied, the... Uh, having tons of nervous energy, right? Just calming down and listening to the other person with open ears kind of uh, puts you out of a situation where you don't seem as if you're edgy or preoccupied or not paying attention to the other person. You want to make sure that you have an open communication style with them and you're actively listening to what they have to say. Now, one of the biggest problems, though, is that we can't always listen effectively. You know, this is one of the major reasons why I want to come back to campus so bad, right? Because there are so many physical and mental barriers that are affecting the way that we're trying to get our message across inside of these college classes, locked down in these Zoom rooms. We have tons of physical barriers, you know. Some students are afraid to ask me questions because as soon as they turn on their mic, you got dogs barking in the background, you got kids jumping in the background, you got everybody's yelling and screaming, right? So there could be physical barriers that are creating all kinds of problems with regards to individuals trying to listen to this particular message. You know, or it could just be something, you know, on, on your end, it could just be a hearing impairment or it could be a technological problem, but it also can be a lot of noise inside the channel, right? A noisy environment, loud music, you know, family members yelling and screaming, you know, people soaking up your bandwidth, so this video gets choppy, all these different problems that are, that are now infiltrating the communication process, which used to be so much more direct. You'd be sitting in a classroom, sitting down at a desk, you know, maybe you'd bust out your phone, but for a majority of it all, the primary stimulus is an instructor telling you a bunch of information that you have to listen to. So. We have these physical distractions that are out there, but then also mental distractions. You know, I, obviously psychological toll, uh, the psychological toll of being locked down for a pandemic is something that we're gonna be facing for years to come. And I swear, you know, all the speeches I've heard in my classes, the anxiety, depression, you know, all different types of mental issues that we're having. People are developing all kinds of new mental issues. We're even talking about re-entry mental issues when we come back into the classroom. There are tons of different psychological things that are affecting the way that you folks are processing the class and the way the teachers are teaching it. But trying to get rid of those, you know, to, to know that you're in control, that you can focus in on what you want to focus in, instead of thinking about other things, or becoming too emotional to even think rationally, you know, these are, these are some of the skills that you need to acquire over the course of your life, because a lot of times we are in those emotional moments. And it's oftentimes, you know, when we are failing, when we are feeling mentally down, when we are in a depressed state, that we really have to pull ourselves up and making sure that we pull ourselves away from these mental barriers, focus in on a particular issue, and try and concentrate on that unique experience that we're having with another person when they're giving a speech or when they're talking to us and sharing something about their lives. Now, uh, there are some people who just have a lack of appropriate focus, right? I'm sure you got those friends who just talk about the most random and inane things that are out there. I mean, my gosh, I got like, you know, 30 friends that are like, Cossum, what are you doing talking about Bitcoin again, <laughs> right? Or what are you doing, you know, chatting about, you know, whatever random thing. I don't know, maybe you got a friend who's really into, into football or soccer, or you're not into sports, right? Or, or you've got a friend who's really into uh, you know, anime or something like that, and maybe you're not. And, you know, oftentimes we do differ on different topics that are out there. But, but some people genuinely seem to lack uh, an appropriate focus. They're asking weird questions. I, 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 it's, I see you got hit by a car. You know, what color was it? You know, these kinds of things. Uh, focusing on what a person has to say is essential, you know, because it's their, 
you're trying to create a, a, a give and take, a tete et tat, if you will, a, a dynamic between you and another individual where you're hearing what they say, you're paraphrasing what they say, and you're asking questions that takes the conversation into a further and better direction. And if you can't focus in on the important aspects of a particular message, then this, of course, will fall by the wayside. So there are lots of influences that can pull you away from this, and some of these are biological as well. Um, you know, some of these might be physical, some of these might be just emotional in a particular situation, but listeners can get lost because they focus in on irrelevancies, you know. So a lot of times, you know, sometimes, especially if you're trying to catch if somebody's lying, you know, you might ask them weird questions off of side tangents and these types of things. But that really harms the conversation, right? Because the person's wondering why you're focusing in on these irrelevancies. Or you might be in a situation where you're just not focusing in on the right thing. You're distracted because you want to interject your opinion. So you're doing this by focusing in on things that justify your case, like let's say in a particular fight or something like that. And these, of course, can, main, can detour you from the main ideas that are out there. So making sure that you listen to the entire message that somebody has to say and then making sure that you're going down the right path to get to it uh, is hard and oftentimes we get pulled away by our own narcissistic or egoistic tendencies that make us want to pull it back to us in some kind of way which detours them or we focus in on irrelevancy because we think it's important to our schema in a particular situation and we have to try to avoid those and then of course finally Remember, your brain is still processing information anywhere between you know, three to seven times as fast as the other person is saying it. So your brain is going off on all different types of tangents that are out there, making sure that you still rear it back in, saying, hey, this is the most important one, is going to be effective to making sure that you respond in an effective way. Now, of course, there's good old premature judgment, right? So Fritz Heider, a uh, famous psychologist, back in the day talked about what's known as uh, the psychological miser hypothesis, that you know, your brain uses a lot of energy, right? It uses like 20% of the energy of your entire body. It soaks up oxygen, right? It can only survive six minutes without oxygen. It always needs sugar. You know, you could go brain dead before your body goes dead, all these things. And, uh, and his argument is, is that your brain is always trying to find the fastest shortcut. It's trying to find the fastest heuristic or bias that you can use. And unfortunately, this leads us towards a lot of bad psychological ramifications. We're really likely to stereotype other individuals, and after we've stereotyped other individuals, we're really likely to prematurely judge them, right? So create, engage in prejudicial behavior. Because it's easier for our minds. If I can say you are X type of student, or Y type of race, or you know, Z type of gender, then it makes it a lot easier for me and my brain to use less energy to look at the nuances of who you are as an individual which is what we really need to focus in on when we're listening, especially empathically with another individual. So we need to recognize that we all have these biases and prejudices inside of our, uh, inside of our minds. Biologically, at least according to Heider, we're predisposed to try and move ourselves in that type of direction. We want to save as much energy by using the least amount of mental effort, and if I can stereotype you or prejudge you in some kind of way, that's going to lead me down that road faster. But we can stop this. You know, this is the beauty of having free will and a complex cognition. We can assume you know, that, that the individual is someone who is completely unique. We can fight out of those categories. We can fight out of those biases. And we can also assume that we don't know what the person is going to say next. They might always be saying something new. And that new information might take us down a whole new path when we're thinking about it. And that's why we want to make sure that we avoid drawing conclusions or judgments based around incomplete evidence. You know, this is uh, arguments I have with all my friends now, right? The truth is, is we don't know what the future might hold, right? Even at this point in time that I'm recording this, we don't know if there's a new variant of the coronavirus that's eventually going to kill off the entire world. We don't know if it's just going to fizzle and die out by the, by the end of fall. Who knows? We, we don't know. We can't predict the future. But gosh darn it all, a lot of my friends think they do, right? I've got friends that'll tell you it's all the way down. We're going to be microchipped and turned into zombies by the time Christmas comes around. And I got friends that are going to tell you that it's going to mutate. We're all going to be dead within the next six months. And then I got friends that say, hey, man, it's not going to do anything. We always overhyped it, right? But the thing is, is we don't know. We can't make conclusions. We can't make these judgments because there isn't enough scientific data. We haven't had years and years of research trying to figure out what this thing that just came out you know, a year ago or maybe a year and a half ago really is, right? We have incomplete evidence. 
And this is one of the problems, I think. I think we want answers. You know, human beings need that ability to say something that's concrete. But unfortunately, the scientific method and our means of inquiry are always incomplete. We judge off of stories, we judge off of anecdotes, we judge off of media, we judge off of scientific studies that are based around incomplete data sets. You know, there are all different types. We're never going to know the full picture. And we, we don't know the full picture right now anyways. We, nobody can make that assumption no matter how much we want to. And the same is true of interpersonal relationships. Just even though you've had a friend for your entire life and you've seen them go through four or five breakups, you don't know how their next breakup's gonna go. Maybe they learned from their past mistakes, maybe they didn't, but the truth is, is you have incomplete evidence. You don't know what that person is going to become at a later point in time in their life. <clears throat> now one of the biggest problems with listening is there really isn't an easy answer. You can't just say, okay, all right, you know, you can do X, Y, and Z, and it'll automatically make you a 100% better listener. Uh, you got to make sure that you choose the right listening situation based around the circumstances. You know, Daniel Goldman writes a book called Emotional Intelligence, and so he was trying to figure out, much like we have an IQ test, is there such a thing as an EQ test or an emotional quotient that we can discern? And the problem is when it comes to emotions is that it's ever changing. You know, you don't respond back with anger to someone who's trying to show you love. You know, you don't respond back with love, you know, to someone who's showing you disdain. You know, they, they, everything needs to be cho chosen and fit within its own unique context. So one of the big problems with regards to listening is listening is situational. You know, it's, it's really hard, right? Because we're in these classes where you're set for certain speech days. And on those speech days, you have to be an effective listener. But that might not be the right day for you. You know, you might be going through a whole host of different situations yourself and then trying to focus in on what another person has to say or what a professor has to say on that particular day might not just be the right time. It might be the wrong situation for you to be in. And so the way you listen needs to be dependent upon that situation. You need to be malleable. You need to be able to move along with different types of ideas, different types of disclosures, reflecting back emotional and content messages depending upon a particular situation. Now, overall, if we were to sort of just take a look at listening, <clears throat> now, we might find ourselves in different areas where it's going to call for different types of attention. So we might have the most in-depth, empathic conversation ever, right? One of your best friends is spilling about a breakup to you. You're trying to be the best emotional support person you possibly can be. You're completely emotionally involved. You might be in a situation where you are walking a mile in their shoes. You're empathically feeling every last thing that they're going through. Or maybe on the opposite side, you might just be politely listening to someone, like a professor in a classroom, right? Yeah, I can read the book. Yeah, it's no big deal. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm going to take a little nap. Shut off that Zoom screen for a second. You know, or you might just be running into somebody that you, know, you never really were good friends with, you don't really care that much about. You might just politely listen to them, right? Or a coworker or something along those lines. You might be in a situation where there's a lot of really important information that you have to discern and weed out to make an important decision in your own life and you may need to critically attend to or listen to. Or overall, you know, when we talk about general listening skills, being able to adapt to a situation, there is sort of a rubric or a guideline that we refer to as active listening, where you kind of adapt along with the situation to at least give the proper feedback to other individuals when you're engaging with them at somewhere between a polite and an empathic kind of level. So let's first talk about empathic listening. You know, it's one of the skill sets that we seem to have lost so much in today's day and age. Uh, the ability to, you, to uniquely bond with somebody, to, to have that moment where you're emotionally with them, is something that I, I think we really have lost, mainly because of our lack of face-to-face -face communication. You know, I've talked about in lecture number one, how we just love to text nowadays. You know, there's, there's something missing, you know, or social media when we only see the good of everybody's pic profiles or whatever they're raging about at any given particular moment in time. The, the, the ability to sit down, you know, to, to just hang out with somebody, you know, have a beer and talk about your day is something that I think is dwindling in our society, mainly because it's so fast paced, we don't have the extra time. You folks are taking classes, working jobs, trying to maintain relationships. You know, the, the moment in time to have, you know, that empathy, that sympathy with another individual to empathically put yourself into their shoes or to sympathize with their emotional experience oftentimes really is a, a rare instance, but it calls for 
the most human aspects of us as individuals. So to understand what a person feels, to, to li listen with empathy is, is a skill set that I think we could use a lot more of and we should try and train ourselves into a lot more in today's day and age. And empathic listening, of course, involves seeing the world as the other person sees it, to, to try and put back your own prejudicial assumptions, your own biases, your own baggage, and, and put yourself into their shoes and understand what kind of emotional moment they're going through and to be able to support them from their perspective. But you want to make sure that you feel what the other person is feeling, but not lose yourself in it, right? Because if they're talking to you, they're venting that information to you. They're probably seeking some kind of advice from you. So at some stage, you need to make sure that you're not getting caught up in all the emotion and all the drama, but you have workable solutions to help them get, a, get themselves in a better position if they're choosing to disclose that information to you. Now, on the opposite end, right, there are just basic social scripts that we engage in when we're just listening to anybody that's out there, right? So, so you know, there is polite listening. You know, it, it, most of you folks are probably engage in if you're walking down the halls and you see somebody that you kind of barely knew back in high school or maybe you see somebody from another class that you saw or, or you see a friend of a friend somewhere out in the street or w when we get out of lockdown, you might run, run into a bunch of people and engage in polite listening. But there are modicums, there are basic, you know, phatic communication styles, the small talk, the asking about pe how, how people are doing, what's the weather like, how's your day, these kinds of things, uh, that just to express basic politeness. So you always want to make sure that in any situation, even if you're just politely listening to somebody, you're avoiding interrupting, right? We're trying not to interrupt other individuals that are out there, because that, you know, takes away or disvalidates them. Uh, it, it takes away their power to ability to communicate with you, and it's just going to kill the communication situation pretty quickly. You always want to make sure that you're giving supportive listening cues. So an open body posture, a smile, nods, you know, eye contact when you are the listener towards the speaker. Very important uh, to get those supportive listening cues to another individual so they know that you're paying attention and focusing in on, on them. You know, even showing basic levels of empathy. Oh, gosh, that really sucks. Or, oh, wow, that's really nice. You know, giving some basic sort of emotional cues back to the speaker while you're listening to them, maintaining that eye contact, and, of course, giving positive feedback. You know, like trying to make sure that you spin a positive out of a negative situation if you're listening to somebody going through a trying time. Or even celebrate their positivity if they are having a great time, that there is a positive situation, and they continue that ball rolling instead of shooting them down. Now again, critical listening, right? The ability to listen to what another person says and not just say you're wrong, right? But to say, oh, this is what I think is the logical flaws within your particular argument. Now when we get to persuasive speaking later on in the semester, we're gonna talk about different types of arguments. And then when you folks take critical writing, the English 103 class, or if you take uh, argumentation and debate, the critical speaking class, uh, you will get a, a few more tools at your disposal on how to evaluate different arguments. But when it comes to critical listening, uh, you might find yourself, especially in today's day and age, where there's a lot of information you know, that, that you need to look at and evaluate logically and dispassionately. So now we're not engaging in that empathic, put yourself in their shoes kind of situation. We need to be able to take a step back and say, what's the evidence? What's the sample size? What's uh, procedures? What methodologies did you engage in when you tried to figure out this particular information? Where is the data from? Is that, is that person reliable? Is that person an expert in their fields? These kinds of things. So when you are in a critical listening situation, you want to make sure, first of all, that you have an open mind. You know, I mean, you might be wrong, and, and that might be a good thing, because the person who admits that they're wrong has one less wrong thing that they're going to do over the course of their lives. Uh, so you always want to make sure that when you're hearing information, to be open to it, right? And this oftentimes has led to some traps, right? Because people just say, oh, just be open to it, right? And then here comes 70 million conspiracy theories. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to accept them, right? You can just keep an open mind. Make sure you hear the argument out before you start to evaluate it crit critically. You also want to make sure that you avoid filtering, saying that, oh, this comes from blank, or this comes from X, or this comes from blank, blank, or blank, blank, and then immediately shut the argument down. You know, you still want to make sure that you evaluate it on its content and its authorship. You want to make sure you recognize your own biases, what you bring to the table. You know, none of us are completely neutral. Though we can try to be, we can try to take ourselves and dispassionately look at a particular issue. But that involves recognizing that we all come to it with our own frame of reference. We all have our own attitudes, uh, experiences, and values that we bring to every situation. And that affects the way in which we attack arguments, the way in which we digest arguments, the way in which we evaluate critical messages. 
uh, we want to try and combat the tendency to sharpen, right? So, so we now live in this, this instant gratification world, right? Where we seek out our own media that makes us feel good, the clickbaits, right? That suddenly gives us that adrenaline rush or that serotonin rush as soon as we have something that justifies our own per personal perceptual schemas. But we have to fight against that, right? Because this puts us in a situation where we aggressively attack the quote unquote other. You know, lots of research on threat construction, how we see the self versus the other. And the more we polarize that, the more likely we are to sharpen or to attack anything that we conceive as being part of that otherness. And it's not always that way. The world isn't black and white. It's tons of shades of gray. <laughs> the only black and white points are probably the colors black and white. Everything else always has some sort of moderation or mediation around it, depending upon the evidence that's being put out in the contemporary society. And then finally, of course, again, when looking at any critical message, you should always be focusing on the verbal and the nonverbal messages. Because you know, we are trying to figure out whether or not the person's being authentic in the information that they're telling us in the first place. Now, finally, I'd like to take a second to talk about active listening. And uh, you know, it, it took the world by storm back in the 1980s. A lot of pop psychology, self-help books talked about active listening. And, uh, it, it is an effective tool. I think that uh, you know, if, if you keep it at a broad kind of swath and you're trying to figure out how to respond to a person initially when you're trying to assess a particular situation, I think active listening can give us some skills. Uh, you know, there's tons of research doing on it now. I just read another one that came out uh, about how everybody should ask three backup questions for every point that another person is speaking. And, and that, that's an interesting kind of active listening area. But active listening usually involves two aspects. Uh, first of all, making sure that you can always paraphrase what a speaker has just said back to them. So you can give an information back that, that regurgitates or, or paraphrases what they actually have to say in a way that, that incorporates your own voice. And then being able to ask a question that has two or more possible alternatives. So at that point in time, the conversation has at least two different ways that it can go. So you give the opportunity not to shut down the conversation, but rather to branch it out even into further areas. Uh, which is something we can't do in the wide world of text messaging, and one of the reasons why I think that we're losing this skill. So active listening is the process of sending back to the speaker what you think he or she meant, both in contents and in feeling. So, so one of the first things that, that we need to get to with regards to, public, or to active listening is, well, is the message primarily emotional or is it primarily content-based? Like right now, when you're listening to this lecture, you're just processing the information. You're like, okay, all right, content and feeling. But when you're emotionally listening to somebody, you know, some your little brother or sister who's going and crying on the TV, you know, you, you want to check their feelings too, right? So you want to make sure that you have a paraphrase that can judge both the content and the feeling. Oh my gosh, are you okay? Does somebody do something to you? Or oh my gosh, you know, how are you feeling? You know, like making sure that you can reflect back the emotional aspects as well as the content of what's going on. Now, what the paraphrase does is, first of all, it checks your understanding. So I hear you saying that this is a lecture about listening, right? You know, it, it checks your understanding of what I'm actually talking about, or vice versa. Also, in addition to that, your paraphrase acknowledges and, expect, acknowledges and accepts the speaker's feelings. So at this point in time, it's not like you folks are probably too emotional about this message, but you might be in a situation where a person needs validation, right? That they're feeling particularly down, or they're depressed, or, or they're losing their job because it's getting you know, turned into a teleconference thing, or, or just massive reductions, or, or maybe somebody's stressed out from too many classes. Making sure that you acknowledge those feelings and being able to reflect that back upon them is an important skill set to have. And then also, you want to ask a good question. You want to stimulate the speaker into further exploring those thoughts and feelings. Wow, I, I can't believe that that just happened to you. Um, do you think it's because they've always had it out for you? Or was there a unique experience that led to that? So you want to make sure that you ask a question that has multiple different venues by which they can continue the conversation so you can have a real thoughtful uh, interpersonal dynamic that leads to something more powerful. So to sort of sum it up and just break it down for you, it involves paraphrasing. So I hear you saying blank, 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 and blank, right? You sort of paraphrase up what the other person has. So you can check to see that you're on the same page because you always want to make sure that anytime you're having a conversation with someone, you have a coordinated management of meaning between the two individuals. You want to make sure that you express understanding 
of the speaker's feelings. So you're also trying to get the underlying relational content of a particular message, if it happens to be a particularly emotional situation. And then you want to make sure that you ask questions, that you perception check. You're asking questions that have more, multiple different avenues that allow the conversation to continue on further and more meaningfully and deeper than it normally would. Now, of course, you know, there's some differences, right? So, you know, statisticians and psychologists have always been breaking people out into groups and saying, oh, okay, are there gender differences? Are there race differences? Et cetera, et cetera, with regards to listening. Um, remember, of course, listening is difficult. You know, it's exhaustive. It, you know, oftentimes, I don't know if you folks have had to take classes all day, right? But, but just listening to a lecture, even right now, you're probably oh, a little bit on the end of, your, uh, end of your rope. You know, we only have a certain attention span before we get distracted. You know, it is a difficult process. You're, you are engaging in a lot of information that you're trying to put into perceptual schemas, and you're trying to keep it fresh so you aren't falling back on stereotypes or biases or prejudices that are out there. And, and it's difficult because we all come from different situations, too. You know, everybody has a different frame of reference. You know, some of you folks might really like dogs. Some of you folks might really like cats. Some people might, in here might have one particular ideological stance on an issue. Somebody might have another ideological stance on a particular issue. Everybody's frame of reference is different. We were all raised in different situations. We all have our own unique life experiences. To try and create a bond from that can be psychologically taxing. And then, of course, effective listening may be improved if we understand those cultural or gender issues, right? So the, so the biggest, you know, uh, psychological tension that we see with regards to listening is, is that when it comes to women, oftentimes conversational topics tend to be more relational in nature, and when it comes to men, uh, conversational topics tend to be more task-oriented, right? So this leads to infamous books like Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, which I don't know how much credit I really give to, but there is something to be said for when a guy wants to fix a problem that a woman just wants to talk about, you know, that, that, that can be a common theme or thread that we see. Or if a woman wants to listen to a guy express his problems, but he just wants to get something done, you know. And we see these tropes being played out all the time within stories. But, but be, understanding that sometimes people come from different positions. Sometimes they just want to be listened to, or sometimes they want action on a particular uh, situation, oftentimes can help us focus in better when we're doing those percep perception checks. Hey, you want me to go, uh, go rough them up for you, right? <laughs> or, oh, do you just need a hug, right? Might be better informed if we take a better look at the contextual variables that might come down to cultural differences or gender differences between individuals that are having a conversation. So finally, the last slide, right? Of course, listening, crucial to success, right? Every boss in the world, every job you're ever going to have, you're going to be taking orders from somebody. You're going to have to listen to somebody to give you that information. If you want to get a degree in college, you're going to have to attend and listen to what another person has to say. Listening, very critical to making sure that you advance and proceed further in life. Inside of our interpersonal relationships, being able to bond with other individuals, our family relationships, our friendships, being able to listen to another person effectively, where you listen to their main points, you understand who they are as individuals, you don't bring your biases and prejudices to the table, all very powerful tools to enhance your everyday life. Remember, of course, that the definition of listening is the process of receiving, constructing meaning from, and responding. So, you know, making sure that you're not just hearing and having it bounce off your eardrums, you're attending to it, it's going into, it's, you're receiving the information. You construct meaning by putting it into your own frame of reference, understanding the particular information to, remembering, understanding, and responding to that, that spoken or nonverbal cue that's out there, and making sure that you do it in a way that validates the other person by paraphrasing what they have to say and giving more opportunities for you to take a conversation down multiple directions. It serves a variety of different purposes. You know, sometimes we're just listening to music just to let off some steam. Sometimes we're listening to the news just to get some information. Sometimes we're listening to a lecture so we can get a better grade on a midterm exam. But sometimes we might have to be there for another person, empathically listen to them, and give them the proper emotional feedback that they need at that given point in time. Remember, we went over five steps at the beginning. They all kind of overlap with each other. They're not necessarily linear, but we all engage in them as we're going through the listening process. And then finally, remember that there, there's a responsibility on both the listener and the speaker, that, that oftentimes it is a dyadic process, that even if I'm giving a public speech to you folks, I'm still looking for nonverbal feedback as I'm trying to give that speech to another individual, that I have a responsibility to adapt my message as I'm even giving it, just as a listener has 
and needs to come to a situation with an open mind and with the ability for them to adapt their message or to adapt their questions or their paraphrases depending on what they're hearing from the other person. Very dynamic process that's ever evolving, very situational, and uh, can be one of the most powerful skills that you ever can have. <laughs>